Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit 82 Cafe at 82 Steinwehr Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house and have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your visit. Check them out at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options and their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order. That's 82 Cafe at 82 Steinwehr Avenue across from the Dobbin House or raggededgerc.com. Audiobook narrator, Mike Scott. Narrator of Savas Beatty's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. The 1863 civilians of Gettysburg were reluctant witnesses to the great battle. Join Ken Rich, the man in the red shirt, for his historic town walking tours. You could book these tours by emailing ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. That's ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. And when you're in town, look for the guy in the red shirt. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg campaign turn by turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass's birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit CivilWarTrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide. And like we did in the spring with Lewis Trott and Chris Army, we are doing another episode uh, where we have uh, guides on to talk about their top five uh, most recommended books or, you know, the books or references that they recommend for people who want to learn more about the Battle of Gettysburg. This time, we're calling the show Ladies' Choice. We've got three of our lady guides on the show today, we have uh, in the studio with us Jesse Wheedleton. Um, on uh, Google Meet, we have Deb Novotny and Sue Boardman. Hello, ladies. Hey. Hi there. <laughs> and uh, how are we all doing today? Jesse, are, are you doing all right? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Good. A lot going on. You got some cramming to do after this, yeah. right? You're leaving. I'm always cramming. Yeah, you got something. To, what's going on tomorrow? I'm leading a tour about Chamberlain and leadership in Little Round Top, and it's nice. going to be. Oh, just watch the movie. The whole just time. watch the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, looking for places of shelter. <clears throat> oh, good. Uh, oh, for the rain that's coming tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun for you. All right. Very good. And uh, Deb and, and uh, Sue, how have you been? Very good. Yeah. Very good. Good. Things are winding down. A little bit, so. Yes, it's it's good to have things wind down. <clears throat> as much as we love the season and meeting all the interesting people from all over the world, uh, it's good to get some rest and have that downtime throughout the winter, because we need it. We need that time. Uh, okay, so we're going to get into the books here now. And uh, Jessie's got to go and, and study for tomorrow, so I'm going <laughs> to let her go first. And, and then we'll go. Is it go. Lawrence Chamberlain or Joshua? Uh, don't call him Lawrence. Mm. But his name is Lawrence. Uh, it's true, and it was a custom to call people by their middle name back then. But anyway, Jesse, go ahead. Give us your five, top five books. Start with number five and work to number one. How's that sound? I didn't rank them. I just tried to pick. Okay. <laughs> Nor are these my top five. So books. these are top five. Bo- <laughs> Great, because you ruined the whole. <laughs> Nor are they about Gettysburg. These are five. Nor are they books. about Gettysburg. <laughs> these are five random books that yeah. I picked off the shelf, and they're all fiction. North and South, I see there. All right, go ahead. Well, I don't know. I feel like my top five books might be the same as other people would pick. But so I started out reading. Everybody said you had to read Coddington to pass a guide exam. So, right. um, but before that, um, when I started getting interested in guiding, I was a Segway Wrangler. And one of the uh, people I would talk to pretty much daily was uh, George Gargas, who's recently or since passed away. But he would always have um, the Civil War for Dummies on his dashboard, and he took notes on everything he read in the books, on notepads, Mm -hmm. very small, very small writing as well. Um, And although I haven't read Civil War for Dummies, I have it, (laughs) I have his copy with all his notes on it. Yeah. Um, And he told me the first book I should read was High Tide at Gettysburg, and I did, and I enjoyed that, and I think that helped me read Coddington, Mm -hmm. which is not that, it's not that 
boring. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's denser than the other. Coddington is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say it's boring. It's I mean, if you're well. interested in the right. subject, you know. Yeah, it's not too much. Right. Um, but I, I'd say the first, so one of the books I brought, uh, the first real book about the Civil War I ever read was this book on the 20th Maine. Mm-hmm. It's just called The 20th Maine by John Pullen. And uh, it starts off with uh, Adelbert Ames or Adelbert Ames or however you want to say it, uh, getting getting the regiment used to being a regiment. And it's pretty funny. Um, it's pretty it's, funny. It's a good way of telling the story. Okay. And it, it really kicks off and moves along pretty well and just takes you through their whole experience, not just... So the, easy read, you would say? Yeah. Okay. So if, you're, if I'm a beginner, but, but like, that would be... he uses a lot of soldiers' letters. Uh, he got access to a lot of, um, you know, original... Uh, diaries and letters back and forth from different members of the regiment. And so, let me ask you this: If so I let the soldiers tell the story as well. If I only know of the Twentieth Maine from the movie Gettysburg, and I've watched it over and over again, and I've never visited here, but I want to visit here, and I want to learn more about the Twentieth Maine, is that going to disappoint me? Because no. it's not the movie version of what happened. No, because it starts off with something that's not really. Uh, Anything to do with Gettysburg? It's not. It doesn't start like. With the movie, I, I don't know. So it's there's not more than the movie to start with. It's the history of the twentieth Maine. It's yeah, not whole, just Gettysburg, the whole story. right? Gotcha. Okay, good. All right, what else? That's three. Uh, what? Oh, That's no. three that you have. No, this is one. Huh? This is my That's first one. book. Oh, okay. <laughs> Those are the other books that I read. Not my top five books. Gotcha, gotcha. So let me just uh, cross this out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. So then, like. Of the books I was trying to choose from, I like all of Harry Fonz's books, um, but this one would be my favorite, um, Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. Second, oh, okay, Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill, very good. Because... Why, yeah. You know, Coddington is a one-volume treatment, which, you know, if you can't, you can only put so much into one book. <laughs> right. And these allow room for the fun stories that everybody likes that helps it... Um, but but as accurate as I don't know, as I care to get into in anything that I anything that I do. Um, do you find that to be an easier read than Coddington? I mean, just just most because are. there's room for for more stories. Yeah. I think Fonz in general is just easier to read. Yeah. Much I, easier. The writing styles, you know, a lot but more un- modern. But unlike some of the other books, you know, it's it's accurate. You can look back and see where all the sources are from and mm-hmm. all of that. Right. Um, okay. So, and it's my, I guess my favorite area of the battlefield is everything over there. So. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. All anybody right. else want to? Yeah, yeah ladies, just... <laughs> you can feel free to jump in at any time. You I don't can't have see to... what books they have. Well, it's a surprise. Okay. Jesse, I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> That's my favorite Fonts book and my favorite place on the field. Nice. Yeah. Is that one of your books? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you gave it away. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> it's supposed to be a surprise. Well, they were gonna be, the audience is waiting with bated breath. Be here. Okay. I didn't know I could Zoom. I could be in my pajamas. Well, it was a misunderstanding on my yeah. part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <clears throat> um, and then I brought Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg by James Hessler okay. and Wayne Motts. Now, why why that one? Because there's a lot of Pickett's Charge books. Why that one over, say, Carol Reardon's or George Stewart's? I like that it is designed to be a tour, but you don't have to be here to get everything out of it. Like, you can read it at home and still find it enjoyable and find so, new so like, stories you probably didn't know before. Like, it reads like a regular book, but it happens to also be a tour book or tour guide? Yeah, like, if, yeah. if you want to do what it's meant for and take it out on the battlefield, you can gain a lot more right. from it. But you don't have to. And one of my favorite things is they included the some pictures or one big picture from the the balloon that is since Oh yes. Balloon. Yes, the, the I was kicking myself for never going up in there. I know. Have, yeah. There was a there was a, a for a very how many years? Like two or three years that was there? The balloon? I feel like it was around the like, like the 150th anniversary or like right right before. Yeah. It wasn't very long that it was there. And then it was right by Pickett's Buffet. And they used to like just go up on a tether and then I guess a guide would point out stuff and then you'd go back down. Is that how it works? 
I didn't know if there was a guide up there. Oh, no? I don't know if there was a guide or not. Oh, I really? Just, yeah. I, there may have been. I never went up in it. Cause, yeah. Like, Seward, that, Seward, Deb, have you gone up? Did you? Did no. You, no. I don't like heights. <laughs> <laughs> Same. It was, um, it, it was pretty close to where ABC, um, ABC restaurant is now. Yeah. That's where they. Oh, okay. So it was a little up from uh, Pickett's Buffet. Uh-huh. Yeah, I only ever saw it in the air. I never saw where it originated from, so I wouldn't know. Yeah, to be honest with you, a giant silk bag full of hot air doesn't really inspire <laughs> a lot of confidence in me. <laughs> no, and I don't. I'm already terrified of heights to begin with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm I'm happy right on the ground. I don't need to be up there. I've gone up in a hot air balloon before, but um, but I kind of gotten over. My fear of heights for that time being, it's come back uh, yeah. <laughs> since I worked on, like I worked on ships for a while and was able to conquer it for a while. But yeah, I don't care to do that anymore. Um, That's no. fair. But when you, when you rise up, it makes you feel heavier. So it makes you feel like you're even oh, more yeah, grounded not like in the basket. Oh, it makes you, f- so it makes you feel more secure in the yeah. basket. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. That's gotcha. one thing I noticed. Okay. Well, then maybe it wouldn't be so bad. All right. And then you have one more or is that it there? So that's the only thing I liked about the book was that picture of the great. That's the only <laughs> thing you liked. <laughs> it's not true. But, but yes. I'm sure Jim and Wayne will be thrilled uh, yes. to find that out. <laughs> they're they're going to write you thank you notes. Mm-hmm. All right. And what's next? Oh, this one here. Uh, and then yeah. I just brought two books that I thought that people wouldn't know about that I thought were very helpful, but... Um, off the beaten path. Uh-huh. Um, now, when I first heard about this first one you're going to talk about, I thought it was about clams, and I got very excited because I love <laughs> clams. But that's not what it's about. Go ahead. What's the name of the book? Um, it's called The Half Shell Book. It's by Jack Melton, who does, Jack Melton Jr., who does the Artilleryman magazine. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I guess there's just a bunch of people sitting around with huge collections of artillery shells, and there they figured are. they were going to sacrifice some so that people could learn more about them. And they cut most of them in half so you can see how the fuses work and all sorts, anything you can imagine. That's pretty neat, those so pictures. It's, so it's like the most detail you could get to if you want it. Right. And I have my own cannonballs, so I was interested in how much they should weigh and all of that. And so it leaves no rock unturned as far as yeah as far as what now wait let me say, open that page there up. so yeah so look they would just put is that, is that a mini ball in there yeah yeah, yeah. So oh that's the, cool the so they would just throw anything in there yeah. inside okay and what's what's really helpful too is there are even some like 3d models of like what a borman fuse is and how it goes off and like mm-hmm. x-rays of some shells they didn't they didn't cut apart so like i never understood how the borman fuse like burnt down and went in and actually right. detonated it. Right. Now I do. Now, is that book easy to find? Is it still in print? Uh, yeah, they still advertise it in the magazine. Okay. So I've never seen it on any bookshelves. Do you have to get it just through them? Or? It's expensive. So I just grabbed these from the guide library. Uh-huh. <laughs> I haven't even bu- bought it, but... Um. Okay. But so the half shell book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Matt, yes. The, uh, the author of that book is the owner editor of Civil War News. Okay. okay. And he's up here a lot. So I'm sure at the shows every summer, you can pick up that book. Gotcha. Okay, good. The owner of Civil War News. What is the name? The Half Shell Book. No, his name. Jack yeah. Jack Milton Jr. Okay, thank you. All right, Jesse, and that's it for you? Uh, and then this, this one is um, called Built from Stone, the Westerly Granite Story. Mm. Oh, this is about how they made the monuments? Yeah. So they Westerly... Uh, provided granite for, I think, 80 monuments. Correct me if th- sure. there are a certain <laughs> number, like 50 something are, are um, like the whole monument, like the like the first Massachusetts on the Emmitsburg Road. OK. Or um, or the Calvary Monument on the Mummersburg Road, like the really beautiful, fine granite. It's just this particular bubble of granite that popped up in that area. OK. That's super fine. And at one point, it, everybody in that town in Westerly was part of the, the granite industry and, you know, worked at the quarry. But then they have, you know, immigrants that are the artists that would, trans, that would, you have artists that make the design and then you have stone cutter artists that transfer that sculpture to stone. Okay. So there are all sorts of different people and all the steps of the process. 
And I guess what kind of got me interested in it was the rock carving on Culp's Hill that's under the 149th New York um, because their original monument was Westerly Granite and they hated it. So (laughs) they uh, got another um, quarry in New York to make the one that stands there today with the bas relief of. um, Is that the. Wait, so the one that they had originally, is that the monument you wanted me to ask my friend to go and see on his property? Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Yes, the discarded. So when they of it. right, so the the monument that disappeared. But uh, is it the whole monument or just the base? What that's discarded in his yard. Oh, I don't know what that is. I don't okay. even know if that's part of that monument. Because when it, when especially all the monuments on rocks, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they had to cut pieces away and fit them, and uh, you know, like chunks of those are in stone walls, different places on the battlefield. Right. Right. Um, okay. But. When they put the westerly one in, it was somebody that was with the carving team carved his name into the rock and said and signed it westerly as well. Um, and they were able to find, I think Tim Smith uh, found his name on um, like a census record or something for for westerly, and you see all these different jobs of like, so you can see what job he had, and then in this book you can see a little bit more more about it. But at one point they interviewed everybody in the town, and. Uh, just asked them what they remembered about the stone carving days and some of the stories that are sprinkled all through here are pretty funny. So is this, this is a, uh, a Gettysburg centric book or is this about the people that made monuments so I, I didn't all pay over the place? To the rules. Um, no, it's okay. So, <laughs> so it's like in cemeteries, but, but they made, you know, a huge amount of the monuments that were here or yeah. that are here. Yeah. So it's, it pertains to Gettysburg. It's okay. But even if it didn't pertain to Gettysburg, it might, you know, lend some insight into how monuments are made. Well, my favorite story in the book is of uh, of this lady who's remembering some man who was sculpting. For some reason, they'd saved the most delicate pieces for last. And there's like some of, you know, there's like an angel like reaching her hand into the air and they've they got a, a piece behind it. And so they carve out the stone behind the hand and all of this, and then in between all the fingers, and they save those kinds of things for last. And I guess he was working on a hand like that, and it broke in some way that was never going to be fixable. Uh-huh. And he just dropped his tools and like went to the woods <laughs> and like stayed out there for, for days. And that sounds like something I would in, do. In my head, I'm just imagining him like curled up in a ball and people, and she said people would go out there to check on him and like bring him a coffee. Really? And <laughs> like, they're, like they're pulling up his blanket around his shoulders and getting, him, you know, until he could finally come back. Again like he's in quarantine or something. Yeah. All right. Well, so there you go. Those are Jesse's five plus a couple of extra uh, uh, recommendations there. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, feel free to jump in at any point here. Let's uh, let's go to Deb Novotny next. Deb, what are your top five? And are these are these in order from you know best to worst or not worst, but you know least favorite to best, or, or are you just going random order here? I by chronology. I'm sorry. Say that again. <laughs> I went by chronology. Chronology. Okay, that's interesting. All right, very good. So here we go. Deb Novotny in chronological order, in order of appearance. The first one I want to talk about uh, was the one that got me hooked. And I'm 13 years old when this book came out. It's called The Long Encampment Mm -hmm. by Jack McLaughlin. And I think it's easily, you can get it on Amazon. They made thousands and thousands and thousands of these, I think, for the centennial of the battle. And uh, it's it's amazing. I I read it so long ago. And then um, a couple of years ago, I think I reread it again. And I can't tell you how many human interest stories that I tell on many of my tours, this is the book that they came out of. Okay. And so just a little teenage kid that I am, <clears throat> you know, it's very, very readable. And it's just, uh, you know, it is about Gettysburg. It doesn't do too, too much pre, pre-Gettysburg. Um, I mean, they'll talk, it, they'll talk a little bit about, you know, the Confederates moving up from Virginia 
and the reasons, you know, but it's, it's extremely readable for a, uh, somebody who just, just wants to say, I, I want a little bit more, the killer angels or the movie. Okay. But, and, and then he throws in, there's a lot of pictures. You know? oh, good. That's good for it's me. Like pictures of what these guys look like. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, and he even has one of the bo the balloons, the Intrepid, uh, that were used during during the I guess 1862. They didn't use it much Full uh, because people can kill you when you're in the back. <laughs> yes, yes, you're. I figured out they could shoot somebody 800 yards. <laughs> You're kind of a good target. Yeah, Who you're wants a good to go target. up in the basket now? <laughs> <laughs> I have a volunteer. Exactly. And that. He even has the picture, the picture of the dead, quote, sharpshooter behind the barricade in Devil's Den. Mm -hmm. But then he has a modern view beside it. So it's kind of like it's pre-Bill Frasnito doing that kind of stuff uh, in a Journey in Time. He doesn't do that too often, but he has a few of those. And boy, the big, there's big trees in Devil's Den. You know, when he took this picture. But here's something that I really liked about the long encampment. Okay. It it doesn't the last chapter is not, well, the Confederates went back to Virginia. The last chapter are there's things of some stories about the reunions and the veterans coming back. Okay. And the last uh is that seventy fifth anniversary when the peace light was dedicated the eternal light peace memorial and i think that's maybe that's why he's calling it the long encampment because you know they are coming back and uh, even so we have some internet they leave Okay. And, so wait say that part say that part i'm sorry deb say that part again our, our internet kind of uh, froze there for a second uh, the, the, he has them being here for that week in 1938, and then they're getting on the train to go back home. Now, remember, the average age is 94. Of these, <laughs> Some of them were much older than that. And, and the last paragraph, I mean, it, it brings a tear to your eye because he says, and, and I'd, like, I'd like to read it, um, some early morning, perhaps after a long night's vigil, a tired old voice would sigh. A few birds would twitter in the first dawn light. And somewhere a telegram, Grandpa died. The old veterans. Yeah. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Everybody loves the Grandpa. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. And, All right. you know, and he tells he told the story about the twentieth um, Maine doing their thing, you know, and that's that's uh, about what nine, ten, eleven years, eleven years before the Killer Angels uh, got that more popular. Mm. So he's got he's got stories in it. Okay, so if I if I have a kid who's a teenager and I want them to get into this, or maybe they're starting to show an interest, would this be a good book for them? Oh, that's that's definitely the one. Early teen years, 12, 13 yeah. years old. Yeah. Okay. That. So that's Gettysburg, The Long Encampment, for those of you out there who want to uh, turn your kids on to this stuff. Okay. What what else you got there, Deb? Okay, I've got Glenn Tucker's High Tide at Gettysburg, mm -hmm. and it's it's the most readable book. That's the way I say it, the most readable book about the whole story. Yeah, the his writing style, uh, I think it's very, very good. It's very easy to read. If I'm not mistaken, I thought when I looked into Glenn Tucker's, the author's background, was he a newspaper reporter? I don't know. Sue, do you know? Sue's muted. There she is. Sorry, I'm unmuted now. Um, I don't really know. I, I do not know. I just know that that is really a popular book. Yes. every oh. it's, I think it's been on everybody's list. Except Jesse. Now, here's the problem. You know, I would, people would ask me on a tour, well, what, what book should I read? And I say, well, 
you know, go to the bookstore at the visitor center and get Glenn Tucker's High Tide at Gettysburg. And then I think somebody uh, maybe texted me back and said they don't have it. I went in and asked because they always carried it. Mm -hmm. And they said it's out of print and they can't get it. Really? Somebody should print that book. Now, I have seen it, however, uh, used uh, many, almost every time I go into For the Historian, there's a copy and it's not the same copy. Like it's, it must've been a very popular book at one time. And a lot of people who had it are passing away or something, or just, you know, getting rid of their stuff. And so it's, I do find it in used bookstores a lot. So if you, it is a good book to get a hold of and I might have two copies. So email me if you want to have one of those copies. Yeah. Maybe even like the book sales that they have like at the Adams County Library and yep. the ones that go on every year. In fact, I know I have two copies because someone gave me a bunch of their old books and I have a second copy of that. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry, Deb. Yeah, I'm sure they go on Amazon or eBay and, you know, those sites, A books, uh, you know, they, they have them because it, there were so many. Sure. Made. Yeah. And, and, that, and once again, I get a lot of my human interest stories from Tucker's book. Um, the story of the missing canteens of the, the 15th Alabama. Mm-hmm. That's where I got That's where I got it first. And um, the missive in the roses. The what? Know, that, the missive in the roses. Okay. What's that one? That's when John B. Gordon was going into um, near Wrightsville, Wrightsville, and a little girl ran up to him with oh. a book of roses, and it had a message inside, you better watch out, you know, they're up ahead, <laughs> Yeah, warning, warning them. Yeah, the little rebel spy girl, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's a true story. Um, if it's so, not, it's an interesting one. Right. Yeah. And I have found over the years of guiding, you know, people want to know what happened battle-wise, but they like the human side. Yes. I don't care if you're 7 or 70. If you start saying, oh, I have a story that goes along with that, your ears perk up. Yep. And they'll never remember that Company B was over there, but they will remember the stories, that, and you can vary them. There's there's no boredom in guiding because you don't give the same stories all the time. That's where you can vary your tour and you cater it to the customer. First thing the guides ask is, where did you grow up or where are you from? Or do you have a particular regiment that you like? And try to connect the, connect them. That's one way to engage your customer. Sure. And some of our guides are really good that they can connect countries to the battle. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know a few people like that, and they they impress me. I could never do that. I saw at Don Walters on a tour with people from, must have been over 20 different countries. And I'm like, you have the tour for you. <laughs> <laughs> is that his thing? Yes. Is, is matching countries? Yes. Really? Right. But Deb, I'd just like to say that I I became a guide because I met people like you that oh, well, I'm just saying that's that nice. there are guides that are burned out and bored, you know, with their tours. Okay. They don't come on addressing. No, <laughs> they don't come but here. I've met no. people like that. Um, and I've met guides that have been doing it for 40 years and 50 years and are still, you know, giving 110%. And it's because of that, because, you know, if you can make it, if you want to make it interesting, you can make it interesting for yourself. Yeah. Well, that was very nice of you to say. Uh, and, and yeah, it's uh, you can tell when somebody has a passion for it because they can do it over and over again. You well, know? And I don't really plan ahead that well. And <sighs> this, is like, this is my retirement plan. So mm-hmm. if I can sit upright and give a tour, I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else will drive me around. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, maybe Getty's bike can get a rickshaw and we can drive you around in that. How would that I, be? That'd be fun. An electric rickshaw. Can you imagine Matt pulling a rickshaw? <laughs> I'll be dead by the time she's around. retired. Yeah, everything comes back around? What do you mean? You know, in style. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, rickshaws are coming back. Yep. Uh, okay, Deb, what else you got? Well, I like I like all of Harry Fonce's books. Um, I like The Second Day. 
uh, I don't, and it's not, you know, it's not anything against Jim Hessler, but I'm not crazy about Dan Sickles. <laughs> but, you know, once again, he knew, he knows how to write. Uh, I mean, you can't, you, it's not a book that you pick up and you, and you read it in one sitting. So it is in depth. And so once you get the handle of who's who and who's on what side, mm. you read these easier books, then you need to get these um, more in-depth books. Yeah, good point. Because you, you yourself will crave to get more. So I was excited about the second day, and I did really like the uh, Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill second book he made because he, um, he hit an area that not much had, was written about. Mm, yes. Like, you pick up Coddington, and do you know how much he talks about Culp's Hill? Not very much I, from what I remember. It might be two pages. Real like In total? Yeah, it's it's not much at all. Jeez. Sorry about that, ladies. You know, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, it, it, we needed something that was in more depth. And Harry Fonce was the chief historian of this park when the centennial happened in the 1960s. So I'm sure glad that he, you know, after, I guess, you know, later in life, he decided to put all his knowledge in. And then, of course, the, the last book he put out on the first hmm. was as good as the first two. But I'm I sorry, it was, it was or it wasn't? It, it was not. Right, okay. Not as good, but I think, you know, medically wise, uh, he, you know, he was going downhill. Mm hmm I'm sorry, you know, that he didn't get a third day book out. Yeah, yeah. There's been a few people that have tried to uh, do that, haven't there? Sure. Yeah, yeah. but it's not the same. No. No. And, and his sources were so good, you know, and that that's what you look for. At the, you look in the back of the book first to see what sources are they using. Mm -hmm. And then you read their book. Yeah. Yes. There's a... You um, know, there's a there's an anecdote in the day one book, just as the fighting is starting, um, and the Confederates unlimber a couple of pieces from uh, I think it's Marie's battery, the Fredericksburg battery, uh, and fire at the Eighth Illinois. Um, Buford is coming out of the hotel, and as he comes out of the hotel, he runs into a lieutenant colonel. I think his name is Cress from Wadsworth staff, and Cress had come into town looking for shoes. And so they have an encounter and, uh, you know, he goes, uh, what's the matter, General? And then a, a, a muffled boom goes off in the distance and Buford says, and of course, I'm picturing in my head a very Hollywood shot here where he swings up into the saddle. And of course, it's Sam Elliott. And he says, that's the matter. And then he wheels his horse around and gallops off to the front. Uh, and sends Cress back to uh, to Wadsworth. And so I found that story interesting and I wanted to know more about the story, more details about the story. And I looked it up in the back and, and it comes from uh, Doubleday's book. So then I have Doubleday's book and I looked it up and in Doubleday's book there isn't one sentence more than what Fonts put in there. <laughs> like there's no detail as to why he went in or, you know, like, I mean, we know it was for shoes, but, you know. Is so that, anyway. Is that out yet in the, because you did that in an episode. Um, I, uh, no, that's, that's in the upcoming episode. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. that was done really well. Yeah, no, I like that. that. Thanks. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, and I think you got what, one more here, Dev? Two more. Uh, can, I, can I do one little story about a, a footnote, end note? Sure. That Fonts put in the second day. Okay. I got excited. Now that book came out, I think about 84, I think 1984. And he, uh, he, he talks about this colonel of the 4th Michigan uh, and fighting for the flag because he was Harrison Jeffords was his name. Mm -hmm. And he grabbed the flag from the Confederate's hand because he said he was going to, he told the ladies, I'm going to defend this with my life if need be. So anyway, he's, he's bayoneted, but his men carry him out of the wheat field and he's saying, mother, mother. Mm. Okay. As soon as I read that line, I went right to the end note. I said, wow, where's, what's he going to say about this? <clears throat> he didn't, 
it's annotated in the back, but there wasn't anything about that. Oh. So the very next time I went down to the National Archives, I looked to see if there was a mother's pension for Harrison Jeffords, for the colonel. Uh-huh. And there was. And his last will and testament that he made right when he went off to war left pretty much everything to his mother. So that's why he's saying, mother, mother. He knew he was going to die. Oh. Who's going to take care of my mother now that I'm gone? Those those stories um, always, especially when it's the, you know, like accounts from guys who are on the line at night and, you know, like in the wheat field, for example, and between the lines, they just hear the moaning and all that stuff. And there's always a mention somewhere about someone crying for their mother. Mm-hmm. And and that always gets me because it reminds me that these guys, you know, we look at reenactors, they're all in their 50s, they're like severely overweight and, you know, <laughs> and, and it's hard to think of them as, um, as Civil War soldiers as boys, basically, but these guys are in their 20s. They're, they're still very young men for most of them, a lot of them, whatever, this is the first time away from their home and family uh, for such an extended period of time. And... It just, you know, you could, they could have all the bravado that they want. They can have all the bravery that training allows them. But at the end of the day, when you're getting ready to meet your maker, and you're probably thinking about the most important people in your life, and, and mommy is one of them. And that is like the worst when I hear those stories. Those always get me. Those and dog stories. Like no. uh, What's Her Face over on Culp's Hill. <laughs> I can't. Charlie. Sa- no. No, Sally was the other one. Yeah, the one that hopes doesn't have a name. Gracie, Gracie, oh, but Gracie is what they, that's what everybody calls him now. Yeah. Why do they call her Gracie? I don't know. Because she has the grace of the Lord. I think maybe a ghost reasons. tour connected. Oh, a go- oh is that where that comes from? A ghost tour? No, please tell me no. All right. Well, we're not calling her Gracie. <laughs> I mean, I probably. <laughs> no. Well, then why, why don't we name her Sadie or something like that? Okay, so we take it away from the ghost, or tour. just leave it a no-name I, dog. I, I, yeah, okay. That came from the Culp's Hill dog. That story when, like, I, I always stupidly say, "Oh, and there's a story about a dog here too." And then people go, "Well, what's the story?" And I'm like, "I can't tell you." And they're like, "Why?" And I'm there saying, was a dog. It got it died. no. That's not <laughs> the way you tell the story. And I just can't tell I the tell story because I can't get through the story without getting all quivery and. uh I don't want people to see me that way, so I, I never tell the story. But that, those stories kill me. Mommy and dogs. Boys crying for their mom and dogs. Can't take it. I can't take it. All right, Deb, what else? She's uh, looking at me like uh, I'm a weirdo. You know, <laughs> take, if you're going to take the guide test, you better read Coddington's Gettysburg Campaign. We know that. Mm-hmm. When I can't sleep at night, I have that by my bedside, and I read like two days, and I'm out. I mean, it's not that it's boring. It's just that it is... Kind of boring. <laughs> it's, Monotonous. Well, it's written by a professor, you know. It, you know, he put it together. He was a professor, and uh, he he uh, is good. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of the questions they might put on that guide test come from Coddington. But if you want to read a good readable book, is uh, Stephen Sears' Gettysburg. Yes. As an overall kind of, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and it's funny how I got my copy. Uh, I was given a tour to this guy, and he said, I, I read a book before I came here to get myself ready to see Gettysburg. And I, after I read a book, I... I don't keep them, so I'm going to give it to you. And it was Stephen Sears' book. <laughs> and I had not read it up, up to that point because it just came out. So that's my overall recommendation. Um, once you get to Sears and Tucker and all that, then go to Coddington. Don't, don't start out with yeah, Coddington. Yeah, don't start with Coddington. That's a good piece of advice. You don't <laughs> want to start because you'll never want to read another book. Yeah, kind of. It's, it's too overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, it's. Not but it's not. really good information, though. I mean, it, it's it full of good information. But so, there aren't any. I think there's one story in there. Some, somewhere, I think, around Spangler Spring, he tells some kind of story. Uh, but that's about the only one he has at, for Coddington. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so those are kind of like my, my overall ones. Uh, but then, you know, I don't know if it was my first visit here, but I noticed that Gettysburg had a lot of cannon. 
that's what most people know. Oh, cannon and monuments. That's what they take home. Yeah. So I saw this book called The Guns at Gettysburg by Fairfax Downey. The Guns at Gettysburg. This is his first sentence. The guns still stand at Gettysburg. So, so he tells the story of the battle day by day through the artillery units, some of the artillery units. So it's a really good one, and he's very readable, too. And uh, so that, that would, you gotta, you got to kind of space, go out further once you get the story. You want to get into some more specific. You might find a regimental uh, book, you know, a regimental right. book you want to read about and read it to get the uh, down and dirty, you know? <laughs> right. The guys, the guys in the trenches. Yeah. Get their I don't recommend the official <laughs> records except as a reference. Yeah, that's a tough one to kind of just try to read from cover to cover. <laughs> right. Not right. that you couldn't. I'm sure someone has, but hoofa. That's yeah. too much. All right, and so pick a charge, pick a charge, George Stewart. I still go to that over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very readable micro history, he called it. Um, when did it come out? In the 50s, I think. Maybe 1950s. 59 or something? Was it something like that? Yeah, it was fifty nine. Fifty nine. I got that. Oh wow! Yep. I haven't read that book in twenty be years. One of Sue's books. <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to wait until Sue goes to find <laughs> out what her books are. I didn't know it's a secret. It's a big <laughs> surprise. Okay. So that's my list. All right, Deb. Thank you very much. And um, before we get to Sue, the, we're going to take a break for some commercials, and we'll be right back. Hey, Gettysburg business owners. Winter is just around the bend, and you know what that means, no tourists. But just because people aren't coming to you doesn't mean you can't bring your business to them. If you ship, you're still in the game. And if you're a seasonal business, the time to advertise for your next season is in the off season when people are making their plans. So what's an affordable yet highly effective way of reaching those people? Well, it's not radio. It's not TV, and it's certainly not print. Step out of the Jurassic era of advertising and run an ad on Addressing Gettysburg. We just reached one million downloads, and we're growing by the tens of thousands every month. Beyond that, our audience is happy to support those who support their favorite podcast. So email sales at Addressing Gettysburg for more information about advertising on our show. We look forward to helping your business grow. That's sales at AddressingGettysburg.com. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our sutlery at AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sip from your mug. So head over to AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. Ever wanted to be a part of a movie production? Well, now is your chance. Hope Kelly is still struggling with heartache several years after her abrupt life-changing decision to buy an apple farm outside the small town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. But the loneliness of isolation gradually replaced the peace she initially found on the farm. Sent reeling when her fiancé left her for another woman before a previous Christmas, Hope has sworn off Christmas and relationships. But when her brother Ryan's old army buddy Nick shows up to the farm and is immediately taken with Hope, the temperature starts to rise. Still, it will take a Christmas miracle in the form of Charlie to help mend Hope's heart and allow her to trust again and find love. Join writer, producer, and director Bo Brinkman in the production of A Gettysburg Christmas with named talents like Jake Busey and Lee Majors. The script has tailored scenes to shoot at specific locations to highlight the beauty, history, and capture the Christmas spirit of Gettysburg with the goal of inspiring viewers to visit in droves. Those of you who have been wanting another movie to revitalize interest in visiting our awesome town have finally gotten your wish. And now you can be a part of getting this project off the ground. 
Bo and company are turning to you, the citizens of Gettysburg and the lovers of Gettysburg, to make this grassroots effort work. No Hollywood BS, just pure Christmas joy and romance. Just click the link in the show notes to get started or go to GoFundMe.com and search for A Gettysburg Christmas. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary Building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717-339-1300. To get tickets or a cupola tour, listeners may call Call or walk in and mention address in Gettysburg or by ordering online using the promo code AG1863 for 20% off. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savis Beatty, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. You're listening to the Dressing Gettysburg Podcast with Matt Callery. All right, and we're back. And uh, Sue Boardman, it is your turn now, your top five. Now, how are yours arranged? Oh, arranged? Yeah. <laughs> As I took them off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so like, like a shotgun shot then. Just scattered. Well, you know, th- this is hard. You know, you're talking to three guys who, who probably – read books for 10 years before we ever hazard a shot at the guide exam. Right. And, and I don't know about the other two, but I'm a book whore. I love books. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Yeah. I, I actually have no more room in my bookshelves. I just have piles of books now. I need to do something about that. So, yeah, I know what yeah, you I had to. I had to turn my third bedroom into a library. Yeah. I just didn't have any room. Yeah. Oh, that's not a bad idea. I could make... I could put bookshelves in other rooms. I never thought of that. I'm just thinking. Well, it's one less. It's you know. It's one less bed to make. Yeah. <laughs> there's no bed in that room. That's right. That's right. All right. So, what are your top five randomly chosen off of your bookshelf books? Okay. So my, I think one of the first that more or less guided me on how to be a guide, if you get it. Okay. Is Johnny Reb and Billy Yank. By Bell Urban Wiley, and be, and and the reason for that is because the the human connection. You know, the who shot who tours drive me nuts. The the tactical tours I struggle with. If I get a guy who that's all he wants, you know, that's that's not my thing. Right. Excuse me, that's my robo vac. <laughs> it's it'll be done in two seconds. What, oh, Sorry, so your, your vacuum. <laughs> It's that little one that runs around all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this the first time yeah, we've ever been because, interrupted because by I a Roomba? Have dogs. <laughs> yeah, it's the first time we've ever been interrupted by a Roomba. Luckily, I'm sorry. no. Luckily, <laughs> the technology on these has gotten really good that we couldn't hear that. Like, oh, it, really? It, yeah, it cancels out the background noise a lot better now than it used to. So I, I couldn't hear that. Oh, that's oh, now I, I have it. dogs too, so you probably didn't hear the dogs either. No, I don't hear okay, the dogs unless they bark. That's- they didn't. Okay. Okay. So, so my thing with with Wiley's book is it it immediately 
made the war about humans. Mm. You know, it's like, it's like the, it's, it just really introduced me to the common soldier and that's who actually, you know, did all the work out there. Right. So, so that, I think that just, and, and I, to tell you the truth, I read it. I read both of them almost simultaneously. I'd flip chapters back and forth between the two books because I was trying to, you know, I was trying to see how different they were. And it turns out the Confederate soldiers weren't all that different than Union right. at that level. Mm-hmm. So except, except for their motives and that's so myriad, you know, you, you can't even categorize them. different dreams, different, different dreams. dreams. Yes. <laughs> My family was dud. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So that's one. Number two, I am definitely a context person. If you want me to understand something, I have to know how it fits into the whole. And that's where Battle Cry of Freedom by James McPherson, that's what he did for me. I needed to understand the whole big picture before I could zero it down to understanding, you know, the, the rest of it. Mm-hmm. it. It's funny. I was that way in nursing, too. If I under, If I understood an overall diagnosis, then I could really hone down on the problem at hand. Sure. Okay. It's just the way I think. So, and I don't know if that's pretty, a, a pretty general way of thinking, but that's the way I work. So I really found McPherson absolutely valuable for the pre, the during and the, and the aftermath. But the important thing about McPherson was his conciseness. He was so succinct without being like trivial about it. You know, he, like he did the Battle of Gettysburg in 10 pages and it made sense. Who could do that? Right. I can't do that. Right. You know, it, it was really a cool book. <laughs> and and I and then I met the man and all I could think of was, wow, you're so readable, but I have trouble listening to you. <laughs> 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 He's a professor and that's the way he talks. <laughs> okay. I've okay, never I hope met he doesn't him. hear this. No, he won't listen but, to this. He's definitely a professor. Definitely yeah. a professor. Mm-hmm. So, so that's that was number two. Number three, I have to go with everybody else with George Stewart's Pickett's Charge. Again, as as you guys are very familiar with the book, he's down on that grunt soldier level. Yeah, he literally follows in the footsteps of the guys crossing the field, and he's definitely uh, like it's almost like he was a journalist. Like you were here, yeah, you, know, you were there. He, it's just. It's just a great book. I, I couldn't put it down until it was finished. Yeah. So it was great. No, I, re- I remember the first time I read it, I might have been 22 or 23, and I read it like within a week. I just couldn't wait to get home and read it. And then um, as soon as I finished it, I started reading it again. I just thought it was so well done. Yeah. That was the first book my mom read after we grew up a half hour away from the battlefield, and they right. never brought us here, never talked about it, never learned about it in school, all of that. But... Um, I kind of forced them into it because I practiced so many times in the car, making them take my tour before I took the oral exam. Right. And then I found my mom reading that book and she's like, you need to read this book. And I'm like, I'm so glad you're reading a book about Bigot's Charge. <laughs> and she li- she thought it was interesting? Yeah, that got yeah. her into it. And now, now she's reading a book about um, uh, Cold Harbor. <laughs> so she, she just kept reading. Wow. So yeah. War stuff. Yeah. Um, so, so that was Pickett's Charge, her first Civil War book. Yes. That's a pretty good That's one. A pretty good one. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. is a pretty good one. Yeah, I mean, since a lot of people. Go ahead. Since a lot of people think that's the whole battle. Right, you know, right, might right. Well, might as well start there. <laughs> yeah, good point. No, but it, it is... Uh, right, it's all the human stories. Yes. That, you know, it doesn't matter if you know the rest of the battle. No, exactly. You're going to understand that part of it. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, that, yes, I never thought... So that would be a one to recommend when people are asking me, what's a good first book to read? Well, and like I never a, thought a of that of one. novels kind of jump into some kind of random spot in the story and start from there, yeah. and it gets people hooked anyway. Right. So... And he kind of does that yeah. for the whole book. Right. All right, Sue, what else you got? Well, d- um, to Jess's point, I love the Hessler Mott's book. Mm-hmm. And and, it, and I think it's because it, it's pretty complete and you can, you know, take it out there, but not if you don't want to. You can still read that book. But I just think for the human connection, Stuart, Stuart's the book. Yeah. And, for, for at least people just wanting to get their feet wet. Yeah, I don't know what it is about that book, but I do remember it felt like when I started reading, I, you know, he goes into some personal stuff in the, I think it's the introduction, but when I start reading about the actual battle 
it's just like I, something in my brain. It was like I was just sucked to that place in time, and I stayed there throughout the whole thing because of the way he writes and, the, and how he uh, sets up the book. I, I, yeah, it's a that's a great book, and this is nothing against books we're not mentioning you know these are just people's recommendations <laughs> right. i t- i told everybody you know what would you too, recommend like, endorsing this and not yeah others yeah and, uh... Uh, every one of these books is 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 a great one and plenty of the books that we haven't mentioned are great too but it's only top five okay so go, so go ahead pick a charge and then what else okay i agree with deb with the sears book as a Great alternative to Coddington. Mm -hmm. I actually used to feel guilty recommending Coddington. People would say, I want a one volume. And it's like, well, it's like one volume in the front and then the the footnote, the end notes are the other volume. Yeah. Because you you almost need two copies to keep one open. Yep. So so Sears just took the burden of guilt off me tremendously because (laughs) Sears is so readable. Yes. I mean, it's just, it's Coddington only readable. Yeah. Which is cool. And, and you know, I don't. I don't think Sears is a first, first book kind of thing. If somebody says, "Well, I never read anything about Gettysburg. I need a book." Mm. I would go with High Tide. Definitely. Oh yeah, yeah. But and you know what's cool about High Tide? Tucker was born in 1892. It is conceivable to me that he walked among them. Sure. He probably knew them. Which maybe is what lends so much to the way he tells the story. But anyway, I didn't pick High Tide, I picked Sears. <laughs> but I agree with them on High Tide, on uh, Sears. Okay. Okay, so... so I was going to ask wait, you one real Jess quick. has got a question. Do you, do you think it was harder to read books after you became a guide? Like, not just because you're busy, but just... For, for me yes. personally, I feel like I'm too responsible for the information. I, it's so hard to get through yes. a book. Plus, I'm a little critical. Yeah. Um you pick up a lot of books and it's like you read it and halfway through it's ho-hum, same old, same old, nothing new here. Put it aside. You know, <laughs> yes. it's, it's kind of funny, but, but I agree with that statement, Jess, a lot. You, you do feel a little bit responsible about, you know, what you even recommend. Yeah. And that's why I'm starting to collect regimental histories. Cause those will have things that I've never read before, but uh, you know, a single volume overview of the whole battle you know what else? What what new things are you bringing out? So yeah, that's I can imagine that. Not being a guide, I can imagine if I was a guide, you know, not being able to read books. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, read. and Matt, Matt is guiding in your future. Uh, that depends on whose palms I can grease when they give the test. Yeah. Oh, I would love fairly good answer. I <laughs> no, I would. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take the exam, but I, I did move here to take the test. But um, you know, the show has kind of taken me away from any ability to study, and the show kind of is my study, I guess. But it's mm-hmm. you know, um, I would like to take the test to see what I still need to learn. Um, I don't expect to pass it, and if I do pass the written, I really don't know if I'm going to make it all the way. <laughs> you know, that's that's usually what a lot of guys recommend to folks that are interested in taking is take the first one for fun. Mm-hmm. Don't, you know, just take it to know what your, you know, where your deficits are and what your focus needs to be. Yep. Although it's getting a little expensive for that. When when I took it, and I know Deb, I only paid 50 bucks. Yeah, it's 250 now, isn't it? It's a lot more money now. Yeah. yeah. And then by the time they actually give it, it'll probably be like 750 <laughs> <laughs> Probably. You're probably right. Yeah. Okay. Um, my next book is, I agree with everybody on fonts. I, and, and the reason Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill is my favorite is because it is one of the toughest ones to study for lack of other books mm. L- literally like like i think it was deb said or somebody said uh coddington doesn't even hardly address it and and once i sorted that out that is my favorite places just like jess but i it I was almost self-taught because you can't find a lot of resource information about it and so fonts really tackled it mm. now my favorite thing about Fonz is his maps. His maps in that particular volume are amazing. And I use those on my specialty tours when I do tours over there. So, yeah, his, his is an all-round awesome book on Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill. Agreed 100% on that one. Okay, um, so my fifth book, but then I have a bonus if you don't mind. Sure. <laughs> my, fifth, my fifth book is 
probably not known to a lot of people. It reads like a doctoral dissertation. I could take that author aside and say, dude, could you make that just a teeny bit more readable? But the information is so valuable. I'll take it the way it is if that's what I have to do. It's called Marching Home. Union veterans and their never and their uh, unending civil war, and it's all 100% post civil war. It talks about. Uh, I'll give you just the little the little byline for this book. It's they say this is about veterans who won the war but couldn't bear the peace. Mm, mm. Their lives were not all celebratory like we tend to to think. You know, it's all reunions and and you know reminiscing and 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 glory. It it wasn't not the day to day grind. Sure. And when you read this book, I mean, laudlum addictions, uh, alcohol addictions. These men struggled mightily, and this book really is an eye opener about that. It made me really sad when I read it because it's just the part I always kind of glossed over. Sure, of course, we all do. So, really awesome book. It's I think fairly new. And I accidentally acquired it because I think the author was in town and left a couple of them at the foundation and nobody wanted them. Hmm. So I so I took them and I read one and it was so good. I took all the rest of them and gave them all away. <laughs> so so really, really good book if you want to be depressed. Yeah, about the book. <laughs> Deb was saying and about it, list, or what the book that she reads to fall asleep and Coddington. that marching home has been on my bedstand for I think five months or more. And you haven't touched it? <laughs> no, I have oh. just little bits and yeah, but it, yeah, but it is a very interesting subject. Mm-hmm. But don't you agree, Jesse? I think it was his doctoral dissertation, and he didn't fix it for public. <laughs> you know, the public. He just kind of published it. Well, I haven't. Way read, I people. haven't read any of those. <laughs> oh, oh, well, trust me. I think oh, this will be your first one. <laughs> she wouldn't know. Well, is it is it a little is it a little dry for public consumption? Yeah, uh, it is. But it, yeah, it, right, it is a lot of different subjects that are worth telling. Right. It, I think the subject matter makes it worth plotting through it. And the, and the problem with it, the dryness is because he repeats himself a lot. OK. Well, her but audience which, isn't afraid of people who repeat themselves. But listen, I read a book. Um, I I don't want to name it in case some people think it's an awesome book. And the guy, unfortunately, died a tragic death. So I don't want to disparage him. But he used the word genteel 139 times in his book. I literally kept track by putting little hash marks in the front of the book. I and, think. Okay. I think <laughs> I'll I, name it. It's about it's about memory market and something. I, I knew. I knew. I knew you were going to. I knew it. I knew it. Yes. I knew it. But, but it's, you know, I think that was also a doctoral dissertation. But I like that book, though. I did, too, but I what just got it? sick of the word genteel. It's, uh, do yeah, I have it here? Know. It's the Jim it's Weeks red. book. Red? Yeah. Yeah, Jim Weeks. Yeah. That's who wrote it. He was, and he's editor, was editor of the Civil War Times Illustrated, so maybe that's the editor's way of writing. It might be back know. there, Jesse. I don't remember. But it's somewhere. Or maybe I have it at home. I have so Yeah, it's, it's red. The cover is red. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I thought it was very interesting because I assumed that the tourist industry uh, was a late mid to late 20th century invention. And I did not realize okay. that people started coming here to gawk and like literally after the battle ended, like the smoke had barely cleared and there's people coming to see. And so that's what fascinated me is that, I mean, it's been for forever that we've had. Well, and when. You know, when Gettysburg opened up to the world with the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad, mm. you had people flocking here from major cities. Sure. So it, I don't think it ever ceased. And if it did, it was probably during the uh, Depression. Depression, right. Yeah. And only for lack of ability to travel. But what's so fascinating about it, and, and I would recommend anybody get this book if you're interested in all that, especially if you're a regular visitor here, you know, just to see where everything came from. But like all the different things that they had that, that were built on what we now call the battlefield or the park or whatever. And it's just amazing. Like just not just the Stuckies. You know, not right. just not just uh, the Peace Light Hotel, but like all these weird things and houses and and to us it seems so crazy sacrilegious. and sacrilegious yeah. and everything like that. But no, these are I mean a lot of these things were built while veterans were alive and visiting here. It's crazy. But, you you know. wouldn't know this field in nineteen sixty. No. Nineteen sixty. In fact it was the condition of the field during the centennial that first brought the attention to the mess. And so it very slowly, Charlie Weaver was one of the biggest promoters of preservation. Yeah. And 
he, he kind of started the movement. But I have to tell you, at Gettysburg, I laud John Latcher and his, eight, his 1999 general management plan for bringing it back. I do, too. I mean, I was so thrilled to work on this battlefield when he had it all cleaned up. Yeah, I, I thought that was great. And, and I was critical of him, but I was also 28 years old. And what the hell did I know about anything? But I wasn't critical of him for the clearing. That was the thing I loved. It was just his attitude towards the public that I had a problem with. But uh, that was the best thing to do, I think. I think, yeah, I think uh, that was a great, great move. Was that, was that his idea or who's that? That was outlined in his general management plan of 1999. Okay. Every new superintendent writes one, and that was his. And in the the possibly apocryphal story I hear about it is that right after he got here, you know, he didn't come from a civil war site. Right. So right after he got here, a guide took him on the battlefield and his comment, the, the guide kept showing him pictures and maps because you couldn't see anything. And he said, well, for God's sakes, you know, this is a mess. So supposedly that was the seed that was planted for him to rehabilitate the battlefield and open up the view sheds. I love that. I love that. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So, so my bonus book, and, and I have to tell you why I'm telling you this. My bonus book is Gettysburg, A Journey in Time. Okay. And it's because I am a vastly visual person and I learned my way around this battlefield by coming back with that book and retaking all those images the same way Fraz took them in the 1970s. Mm. So uh, we are building a um, an exhibit to him about him at the New Adams County Historical Society Museum and sitting at the table with him and hearing him talk about the creation of that book was so cool. Hmm. But one day I overheard him in a bar say to somebody, oh, hey, there's Sue Boardman. You know, she's here because of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly my reaction. But I thought <laughs> Doesn't he think everybody who's in there is there because of him? <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much. But anyway, he, I think he was what he was trying to say was that that book had a big impression on me. And I, to this day, collect. I have about 12 hundred Gettysburg stereo views. Yeah, you're you're big view. into that, aren't you? That is my thing. I yeah. have one of those uh view whatever viewers. they call it. Yeah, viewers. And some so somebody gave it to me with a whole bunch of pictures from World War One. Like cool. in the trenches and everything. Yeah. And I yeah. still haven't brought that in to show you. Have a really I? big set of like I think it had like 150 or 200 different yep. stereo views in it of of World War One yeah. stuff. It was crazy. Yeah. It's really cool though to see in three. Yeah, I it love came to in see a Civil War ones. Yeah, I, it came in a sleeve. The one he's talking about came in a sleeve that was that looked like a book. That's what mine yeah. is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They're really cool. But I would love to have you look at my collection. I'll bring sometime. my World War One. You bring your Civil War, and we'll look. Bring my foot. You come over here to my house. I'm not dragging that stuff all over the place. <laughs> well, it's I'm huge. Gonna, I'm not going to invite myself to somebody's house, but now that you invited me, I'll see you there. I just invited you there. <laughs> now, I noticed, ladies, ladies you, you can come too. <laughs> I noticed, Sue, that you did not mention your book about the cyclorama. Well, it's not my favorite. <laughs> still, if there was an opportunity to plug your book. I know. I you like, said favorite book. books now. that guides have written. <laughs> yeah. Oh right. my gosh, there's so no many. All right. No, no. If if you know me, you know I'm not much of a self promoter. So thanks for plugging my You're book. You're welcome. Um, real. You mentioned Charlie Weaver before, and he's an interesting yeah. character. Um, I know this isn't about him and everything, but j just for the sake of the listener who's like, who the hell's Charlie Weaver? Explain who he was and who his okay, grandchildren so are. So if, you, if you've ever watched reruns of Hollywood Squares, this really goofy television show, it was a game show, and there were nine celebrities, and always in the center was this, or no, he was in the lower left corner, I think, mm -hmm. wasn't he? I think so. Is that right, Deb? He I was, think. he always wore a straw hat, and he was a real clown, and his name was Charlie Weaver, but his real name is Cliff Arquette, and he was very, very much a student of the American Civil War. He was extremely smart about it, and he actually had some business enterprises here in Gettysburg during the centennial and during the uh, 1970s. So Cliff Arquette, a.k.a. Charlie Weaver, here at Gettysburg, helped start the Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Association, titled after the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, which was the veteran years. So Charlie Weaver helped start that and to sell, he sold little deeds to the to the land, little just little paper deeds yeah. to raise money for preservation. So he's a pretty, pretty cool guy. And that, that was, wouldn't he go on the Tonight Show uh, and plug that? And, yep, yeah. he would. Yeah, so he that that's cool, and his grandchildren are obviously Rosanna Arquette, David Arquette. Correct. Uh, oh, what's the other one's name? I forget her name, but it's not Priscilla. It's uh, Rosanna, David, and 
Clot oh, no. come on. No. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, somebody Google it. Uh, well, and she's, the, and she's the more famous, isn't she, of them? Uh, you know, they, they kind of rotate in who becomes. It depends on what uh, decade you're talking about. The, oh. uh, the one I'm thinking of was popular in the early 2000s. She had a TV show that I can't remember. Roseanne, of course, was famous in the 80s and early 90s. Is it is it Patricia? Patricia, thank you. Patricia, that's it. Yeah. Patricia. That's it. She was the, the medium. The medium, yeah, no, that was yeah. the show. Well, Patricia, David, Alexis. Alexis, who's uh, dead. And Rosanna. Yeah. She's dead? Alexis is dead. Oh. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry to break oh. it to you, Eric. Wild. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, that's it then. So that's all the books there, uh, ladies. These are good choices. I like these choices. And even though it's not about clams, I do want to get that half shell book because that's pretty interesting Matt, stuff. Yeah. How did the ladies' books compare to the men's books? I got to tell you something. <laughs> the ladies' books, I think, are a lot more interesting and thoughtful. No. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I, you. <laughs> I, no, honestly, I do. I think these are great books. A lot of them are great books for, like, like the way Deb lined them up with, uh, you know, you start with this one at age 13 or whatever and then move on to this. I, I think it was... Uh, I think that's good, especially if there's people listening that have kids that they want to get into this stuff. Like that's pretty good recommendation there, and and I think a lot of the the ones because there, you guys there's some repeats here uh, from what the guys were uh, saying uh, recommending, but I think that's good because I think that hammers home how good these books are, and so people feel confident when they get those books. Okay, this one is good because everybody mentions this book, so I think it's good that you have that stuff in there. I like honestly. Um, I, and so, some of these books, um, The Long Encampment, I think I had heard of it, but I ne- nobody ever told me about it, and I never asked. So now I really want to get that one. And The Life of Johnny Reb and Billy Yank is another one that I really want to get. It's always a, fun to have books like that to hunt for like yeah. in, in this. Yeah. When they let the doors open at some of the book fairs around here, it's like uh, madness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. And, I, and now that we're coming into winter, every week I go to... Uh, for the historian and I check out the used book section to see, oh. you know, what's come in. And sometimes you find these and I've seen some of these titles on the long encampment I have seen on the shelf, but I didn't know anything about it. And so I wasn't sure if it was just some bullshit book that, you know, sometimes they just get put out there. I'm not going to name any names, but you know, some books get thrown out every other month. There's a new book, you know, and it's mm-hmm. like, how could you possibly write a book this quickly? But anyway, uh, yeah, no, the, the, I think the women, I'm sorry. Sorry, guys, but I think the women won this one. I think, of course, there's three of you and there were two of them, so obviously you're going to beat them. <laughs> no, really, these. I think these are good choices. Um, all right, ladies, you've, I've taken too much of your time, and I thank you so much for it. Um, next time you come on, unless you're in another state, it's always in person. We'll do. <laughs> ignore they all. Every time you get one of those calendar invites, it always says Google Meeting or phone number or whatever. But it's always in person. But it's okay. It was my fault. I should have been be more clear. It'll be in person at Sue's house. And it'll be right. We're going to do a whole show, and we're going to bring an audience with us, and we're going to set up in her backyard. <laughs> okay, that works. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for listening. Thank you, ladies, Jesse, Deb, and Tugger. Who's Tugger Boardman? My dog. You named okay. So Tugger thinks Yeah, he's a hundred and forty five pound Rottweiler lab mix. Jeez. You know, you are a feisty lady. And you got a Rottweiler. That makes total sense. Does it? <laughs> yeah, it does. Does your Roomba have a name? Does your room yeah, what's your Roomba's name? Mozart. <laughs> Oh, I don't have my Mozart. I had my Mozart shirt on before. Oh, it should be the beavers then because it sucks everything. Yeah, well, this is my little beaver. See, my, somebody gave me this little beaver mug here. It says, I don't I like a it. damn. Because <laughs> we're always talking about the beavers. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you enjoy this. I hope you got some uh, good information here that you can then go to a bookstore or to Amazon or to our website, to our recommended reading page, and find these books and order them for yourself, for your kid, whoever. Thank you. And good night. All right. Thanks, ladies. Good night. Thank you, Matt. It was fun. You're very welcome. Need a core badge or other insignia for your uniform? Then check out the badge maker. Here's what some of his satisfied customers had to say. Miranda said, I ordered an identification disc from Joe and it's fantastic. He hand stamped it exactly as I wanted. Greg said, my unit has purchased from him in the past quality badges and good service. 
And Jerry S. says the badge maker is the go-to place for accurate replica Civil War badges. So go to CivilWarCoreBadges.com and attach a message with your order saying you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg. Our Huxle Scout have got a stain for suit is known from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down. 